Let's call this meeting to order of the RMLD Board of Commissioners. Uh, the meeting of the uh, Reading Municipal Light Department Board of Commissioners is being videotaped at the RMLD's office at 2.30 Ash Street in Reading, Mass. This meeting is being videotaped for distribution to the community's television stations in North Reading, Wilmington, and Linfield. I understand tonight we are live on the Reading in Reading. So uh, on that, make everybody aware of that. Uh, I read the uh, RMLD Board of Commissioners Code of Conduct. The RMLD Board of uh, Commissioners recognize the importance of hearing public comment at the discretion of the chair on items on the official agenda as well as items not on the official agenda. We ask that all questions or comments from the public be directed to the chair and that all parties, including members of the RMLD Board, act in a professional and courteous manner when addressing the board and responding to comments. Once recognized by the chair, all persons addressing the board shall state their name and address prior to speaking. It is the role of the chair to maintain an order and on all public comment and ensuing discussion. Okay, and so it takes care of the opening remarks. Um, I don't think we need any introductions. Um, we have visitors here tonight from the Finance Committee and from the Selectmen. Okay, and we'll go to public comment. Uh, Jason, you want to? Uh, nothing to add. Nothing? Okay. Anybody from out there want a public comment? Yeah. You want to come up? Anybody? Public comment? Okay. Come on up to the microphone so the cable TV people can hear you. Hi, I'm Barry Berman, 54 Long V Road, and this is only going to take 10 seconds, but um, I didn't want a meeting to, to start or, or to end without me as a, a rate payer and, and also a, a grateful member of the Board of Selectmen to thank the RMLD for the tireless, tremendous work that you did through three storms, I think, and one on the way. So yep. um, I have friends um, who live in Boston, who live on the Cape, who live on the South Shore that still don't have lights. And when they call, nobody answers the phone. So mm -hmm. um, I know there's a lot of business here that we're gonna take care of, but um, as a grateful, uh, public official and as a grateful ratepayer, I didn't I didn't want this to go too far down the road without me expressing my personal thanks um, as a ratepayer um, who lost lights for a period of time but never really felt unsafe, knowing that the RMLD was out there. So I just want to thank you for a job well done. Thank you. Thanks, thank Barry. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Any thank other you, public comment? Then. If not, then we'll go to approve the minutes. We have the January twenty fifth of 2018 minutes. Do I hear a motion to accept as presented? So moved. Is that seconded? Second. second. It's been moved and second. Discussion? No discussion. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Opposed, that motion carries. Um, I attended the uh, Citizen Advisory Board meeting back in, uh, back on February the 28th. Uh, basically, the things that were discussed, they approved the minutes. Uh, there was an update from the general manager on the LED streetlight program. Uh, Wendy presented the financial report. Uh, Tom uh, Olia, I hope I pronounced that right, uh, made a presentation on the North Reading sub, uh, substation energy storage project. And there was just some uh, general discussion on the uh, town, the payment to the town in terms of just, you know, a status as to where things were at that point in terms of the only thing that was really discussed is the fact that there would be a meeting going for, and the, at the next the next meeting was really the only thing that was discussed. One of the things that um, they did request is they actually have set out their meeting schedule from now through the end of December, and they actually requested that we kind of do the same thing. So um, it's one thing we should be working on that in terms of having a, a set schedule on that, and that's one thing they did request so that they know in advance. I mean, they actually set meeting dates all the way out through December the, the 19th at this point. So it's something we should do too I'll, in terms of our, from our end standpoint. Okay. Um, in, yeah, go ahead. So with, is that a, a, an action item we can uh, yes. take? Or I'll maybe? Email tomorrow morning. Right. Good. Right. I mean, should we want to say, is it a particular, a particular day, like I mean, the third week, or like yeah. a Thursday the third week? Okay. So when you send out that, actually send the dates out on that so people can actually know what date it is on that, okay? Yeah. All right, very good. Okay, the next item we have is the uh, report from the, on the subcommittee on the payment. Um, now, most of you actually attended that meeting uh, from uh, 
what I can remember. Uh, the only thing uh, that we, the, the commission at that point uh, basically made a presentation. We, we called it really a trial balloon as we put up at this point uh, as to where we are, as to what, the pres what, our, what we presented at this point. So I know anybody, any of the other commissioners have any other comments on that at this point? No? Okay. Well, Go yes, ahead. just to clarify, it was something that came, it was presented by a couple of members of the subcommittee and there was no vote by the subcommittee, nor was there one by the full board. And there's many steps that have to occur, including CAB, but starting with the subcommittee actually recommending right. something. Right. Okay. All right. Any other comments from the board or anybody? Anybody? Yeah, go ahead. Can you come up to the microphone so we can we can get? Uh, mm. Hi, <laughs> Mark Doxer, 110 Beaver Road. I'm wondering if you could just um, talk through a little bit about what the next steps are um, that you guys will be uh, taking. What approvals would need to take place? What, what's the process from here? If you well, the process yeah. is the next the next uh, subcommittee meeting is next Wednesday. What time is that meeting, Tracy? 5:30. So the next the next subcommittee meeting is 5:30. At that point, where hopefully we are able to we we should be able to uh, a lot of exchange ideas among all the different members. I would hope at that point, and see where we go from there. At that point, and decide the next steps. I'm looking back, to get input from all the different parties, both the CAB, the selectmen, and, and the the board. At that point, too. Yeah, Dan, come on up. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dan Ensminger, a member of the Board of Selectmen, 6 Oakland Road. Uh, I just wanted to follow up and answer Mr. O'Rourke's question a little more completely. Uh, Tom, I think you had uh, asked what's the defined need for this money from the town, effectively a question about what, what is driving this particular exercise or number. Yeah, so let me just to, to right. clarify so, so people know the background. So I think what I had asked in Words so, something like the following <coughs> is that you know the uh, it was really two two thoughts. One is do we have an obligation to make an additional payment or increase the payment? And then secondly, if not, what a little more understanding. You know, it's pretty clear the town every town needs money, but more a little yeah. more understanding if there's something particular driving it. So even if there isn't an obligation, and we sort of. Uh, thought that the white paper dealt with that piece of it that if there isn't an obligation we still we're all part of reading we want right. to be as helpful and supportive as we can but understanding what that looks like and so it was really is it an entitlement in the in not in the negative sense or is it a real financial need that we're trying to address so that would guide our decision making process uh, thank you it is a real financial need let, let me go back to the instructional motion that was passed last uh, in may of uh, 2017 mm -hmm. Instruct the Board of Selectmen in light of the town's difficult financial situation to study the RMLD with an objective of increasing annual revenues to the town of Reading. Uh, drilling a little bit more down on that, uh, I believe the intent of town meeting was to get a more, a better predictable defined uh, stream of money year to year. Uh, just uh, if, let's say we were to take the 2.4 million and on the basis of that higher police officers and do other things. If uh, the run rate of keeping those officers on the force is less effectively than the run weight we're getting from RMLD, we're, we're going to start falling behind. We're already seeing this happen with state aid. Uh, I think our, our town side run rate is somewhere 3.1, 3.2% the way we're managing it now. Schools are a bit higher. Uh, we're trying to keep that down. But uh, state aid is than a half of that, uh, if that. And in the last, the last few years, the CPI index has been in the low 1% vicinity for the last four years, the index for the payments from RMLD. So the idea of having a more defined and hopefully increased from that level, annual increase, it's not a specific earmark we're talking about, but th that piece of the revenue stream can, can be more uh, reliable, if you will, over, over the years. Okay. Does that clarify it a bit? Yep. Okay, thank you. And may I echo Mr. Berman's sentiments? 
We've had relatives move down to live with us now for a total of, I think, 10 days <laughs> over the last three months from North Andover. They have a small baby, too, so they're very grateful, and we are, too, at your many uh, efforts at uh, increasing and enhancing the reliability and redundancy of this system. I mean, we had power losses all around us. We had one flicker, so somehow you're feeding that power several different ways to my house. Thank you. <laughs> it's not based on selectman seniority. Well, I, I can tell you that, you know, where my office was in, you know, Alston, and we had just a flicker, and all our computers went out. And we had to, we had to redo the server at that point. Uh, there is one thing that I, I do want to mention. Um, Mr. O'Rourke mentioned the white the uh, white paper. The white paper is now up on the website for anybody who would like to read it. Um, in terms of that, is the copy of that is on the website at the present time. So, Colleen, you want to? So, um, you would go on the left hand side under meetings, and then board of commissioners, and then there's a quick link on the left hand side. Okay. Very good. Good. Great. Good. Okay. Anything else under the subcommittee? If Mr. Not, Chairman, we'll move just, on to, just, oh, one, just one thing on this general topic that when, if there's an increase to Reading, it's also an increase to the other three towns as well, correct? Uh, that is one of the options. Okay. I mean, because okay. that is one of the complexities of RMLD is that we do serve four towns. 56% of our sales are in Wilmington. The Wilmington um, cab member, George Hooper, is, you know, he sees low electricity rates as a major driver of economic development as as do we. So it's important to balance all these things that low electricity rates equals economic development in the areas where we would like to see it. So this is also one of the main objectives of RMLD is low rates, reliable service, economic development. Um, so and, and all the all the four towns need to be involved in these in these decisions. So that's just something we all just need to keep in mind as a high level concept. Okay. Thanks. All right. Very good. Any other comments? If not, then we'll go on to the general manager's report. Colleen, you're up. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, I'd like to start with uh, me uh, going over the storm data for the three storms that we've just had. You want to come up, Hamid? Mm -hmm. This is the handout I believe we have on the on yeah. table tonight. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Hi. The first slide shows uh, basically the trend of the outages for all four towns. Uh, for the first storm that started, we almost lost uh, uh, 3,000 people, and then we brought them back within less than and the three hours. This is the second storm, basically March 7th. The second storm, we got over 4,000 calls, and we lost uh, approximately 6,000 customers uh, at one point. And then gradually we brought them back in uh, the start of 11 uh, p.m. on uh, Wednesday night, and uh, with 6,000 customers being out. And then uh, the next day we cut it down to 2,500. And then uh, by Friday we had almost 600 people out, 660 people. <coughs> and then uh, on Saturday. We started to take care of the, some of the area outages that you know they heavily got uh, damaged, and lots of the tree, lots of tree issues that you know. Well, even we had one incident that the tree was uh, the, the our line was uh, on the opposite side of the tree line, uh, and then the uh, customer tree came down and took a pole down and brought three others, broke three others, which made extensive damages, and. By Saturday, pretty much we picked up all the area outages and we had left only 12 customers left. And these are the customers that you know well. The service got completely ripped out of the house and they needed the electrician and we needed the approval of, of uh, the wire inspectors in order to <coughs> re-energize for the safety reason. So pretty much, you know, our crews worked uh, around the clock. Uh, we had uh, six uh, foreign crews we had from communities from uh, mutual aid uh, that when w it was activated on uh, Thursday. We had crews from uh, uh, Merrimack, from uh, uh, Holden, uh, uh, from uh, 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 Sterling, 
and also Braintree. And we are grateful for the help that they provided for us. They send the crews with the trucks. We also had two contracting crews, power line contractors. They were also uh, on the property. So all in all, we had like eight crews plus augmenting of uh, six crews that they went around the clock trying to uh, restore the services in the safest manner and as quickly as possible to uh, our valued customers. So all in all, it was successful operation. And uh, I want to thank the crews, my, my uh, staff, for uh, working around the clock trying to bring people back on. And thank you for all the valued customers for being patient. I know it's nobody wants to see outages. I mean, in my community, uh, you know, in Lexington, the people, they, they were still out while I was working over here three days, four days, <coughs> and they had the shelter open. And uh, we had, uh, for almost 10 days, we had people, 150 people out. So that's one of the great benefits of uh, having the municipal utility at us because we're working for you and we take it very proudly. Uh, uh, so that basically shows the trend. As you see, we picked up lots of customers that has gone uh, less than 37 hours. The people, everybody pretty much were picked up and you know, it was a, a great operation. So the next slide shows you the phone calls that you know you see that at 8 p.m. Uh, on, the, uh, on, the, on the 8th, we got uh, the, first, uh, uh, the, first, uh, the first storm. We had uh, 321 calls. On the second day, we got uh, 2,100 on the second storm. We got the 2,167 uh, calls. And we got almost, it shows 5,388 calls on this major storm, this, uh, the, the second storm. And uh, the third one, we got uh, 317 uh, calls. So the volume of calls goes up. You, as you know, we got limited staff. So it was overwhelming, and I know most people, they're wondering about the priorities and how you set your pri priorities and here, there, but, you know, by taking all those calls, trying to sort them out and trying to, you know, set up the, the priorities of how we, which ones are more important, you know, the public safety issues when it comes down to, you know, main lines and trying to keep the public safe. So we sort them out, we prioritize them, and then we send the crew out, so it took a little bit of time to do that. Yeah, and al also, you gotta realize that, you know, we still, oh, based on, you know, the Colin has a good term for it, we're still chiseling on the rocks, trying to pick up, you know, to sort the outages and get the mm. uh, customer calls. So, uh, our new outage management system, I got good news for you, uh, it's gonna be uh, implemented, actually going into operation uh, by April 16th. So, in about a month, we're gonna have a new automated system that automatically, when the uh, customers, they're going out, it's gonna be mapped, and then we're gonna have a list, and the list that, you know, right now, everybody picks up the phone, and basically we put them down and try to sort them out. That list is gonna be provided for us in a matter of seconds. So we have them, and then we can quickly send the customer, the send the crews out to uh, pick up the customers. Just, just the problem. can I ask a question? <coughs> question. Uh, yep. Just to clarify, are you saying you'll know when customers are out before they call you? Yes. Is that what you're saying? Okay. That's right. right. There are two steps into that. Number one is the knowing, you know, how many customers there are out and where those outages are located. And we have, a, uh, actually, there is an option in, uh, in the OMS, outage management system through surveillance, that is called customer portal which means customers, they can go, even you can, you know, uh, bring the app on your uh, uh, mobile phone. Mm. And then you can see the area that, you know, it's out, and it can give you the estimated restoration time. So that's one way to uh, reach out to the customers. But the, the, the second part of that, that's AVR. Uh, AVR. And that's, you know, with the AVR, uh, <coughs> that's a no customer notification process which once the meters they're going out and they're being mapped on the area map that shows the people are out, now we're sending the message to customers that you know we know you're out. Mm. So you don't need to call us back. And that's coming up next year. Uh, so by next year, this time, we should have the a, uh, uh, IVR. Wow, that's great. So, so this is good. Can you explain to them how you prioritize outages? <coughs> we got a lot of calls <coughs> and customers right. are like, 
where am I on the list right. and they wanted information, I think it would be helpful. Sure. The priorities are ba basically the public safety. For instance, uh, the main line, you know, if you have on the main street, you know, the, the, the poles are broken or the something uh, happened to the line that where the tree comes down <coughs> or bringing the pole li the line down, that's the absolute priority because we have to have the backbone of the <coughs> system uh, energized in order to be able to restore the services to the side the street and side roads. So anything along the main drag, that's a priority because there are lots of traffic and when the pole comes down or the wires are coming down, you know, there, there is a huge public safety issue that, you know, could energize, energize the wires basically that are coming down. So that's the most important one. Then we get in, into the fires and, you know, I know the people, they get excited when they see the uh, top of the pole, you know, the transformer is on fire, but in reality, that transformer is de-energized because as soon as <coughs> the fault, you know, uh, it, it, it happens, the fuse pops up. And, and, you know, once the fuse blows, you know, there is no danger really, even though if that, it's just a matter of time before we get, we get to that. We got overwhelmed because we got like about a list of 1,500, <coughs> uh, 1500 uh, areas that they were in trouble, whether the trees they were coming down or the, there was fire or the wires on the ground energized or on the driveways and the services cut out and trying to get these and sort out. And Colin used a very good example. It's like being the fire chief for four towns. You know, then, you know, we have fires all over. So which fire is more important than the other? So, you know, this is the type of decisions that you're going to have to make. Ma make it. But the main street, main drag, got the prior priority. Then we get to the side street and then the side roads. And the services are going to be the last. Because, you know, we can't put up your service if you, there is no power on your street. So we have to bring those uh, lines back in service before we can, you know, give you the, the power and the service to build, build. So the people, if you see wires are down, please don't touch them. You know, we, uh, we go in investigate, and then, you know, if there is a danger, we cut them off, you know, if there is still the street is live. Lots of those wire down calls that the people are worried about, you know, we found out that these are cable. You know, uh, you know, Comcast or Verizon cable, <coughs> and uh, you know there are no dangers on those, but uh, don't assume that you know every wire that it's uh, on your driveway or the street it's a cable because you have to be very approached with caution. Don't step over the, over them or don't try to pick them up, lift them, and throw them, uh, throw them on the side of the road. Uh, that's dangerous. Uh, so we have, and we have, like what I said, limited staff. Once the calls, they're coming in, we have to sort them out, and then we have to investigate every single one of them, believe it or not. So we have runners that they go out on the street in the, your neighborhood, you see them going on to see that, you know, what is the problem? Is it the tree? Is it the pole that got hit? Or maybe the wires are wrapped up, or the tree, whatever the is issue is. So once we identify those and they're being reported back to the dispatchers, then we uh, dispatch the crews and send the crews out. This is a lengthy process for us now, which, you know, it's taking, consuming lots of our time, uh, which during the normal, uh, you know, I would call them, no storm is normal, but, you know, when they're less disastrous like the one that we had before, uh, this usually doesn't take that long, within, you know, because we don't have that many customers out. It could happen anywhere between, uh, you know, uh, half an hour to 45 minutes. And then the crews are out and you're back within an hour or two. Or two. But during this one, it was really overwhelming. I mean, we had lots and lots and lots of priorities. I mean, my guys were uh, logging for over 1,500 uh, calls that they all needed to be sorted out with some type of priority. <coughs> and uh, it was really stressful, but I'm glad that it was done safe. Uh, and hopefully next year that we're going to have IVR as well as now next month, actually by next month, we should be in much better shape that, you know, at least, you know, we have all of those areas that we need to focus on and prioritize and send the people. We're still going to have to send people out for investigation to see what happened. Uh, that's going to be a lengthy process. But I don't want the people thinking that, you know, as soon as you call and you hung up, the truck is going to be at your neck, <laughs> at, at your door. That's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> so as much as we would love, love to do that, and if we have the resources and power, and we were one of the lucky communities because we could get uh, uh, six uh, uh, mutual aid crews. 
Yeah, how did, how did you get that? I would imagine they were in high demand. How did you get those crews, the extra crews? Well, uh, Colin and I, we know many, many, uh, you know, communities. We belong, fortunately, to NEPA that you know well. Uh, uh, once you activate it, uh, every, every, anybody can activate it, but depending on their availability and one, what, they, what they can <coughs> provide. But sometimes a little bit of reinforcement, you know, it would help too. And yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so just just uh, one one item. NEPA is Northeast Public Power right. uh, Public Association. Power Association. <laughs> so go ahead, Colleen. The Colleen. crews we got were from Holyoke, Sterling. They they didn't get hit like us. Ah. So right. even though it took us took them a few hours to get here, mm -hmm. they didn't have the damage. They you know they were all good out there. Right. So but, but in hindsight, too, when they had the major uh, ice storm out there, we sent crews out to that area right. to, right. to help them out. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, uh, so we, we've we talked in other meetings about the uh, the significant capital expenditures that right. RMLD is making, right. and probably more than would be normal mm -hmm. uh, due to historical right. reasons. Right. Uh, how much of that gets utilized to prevent these sorts of things. Now, some of it you can't prevent a, a storm, but it is, a, is a lot of the CapEx expenditures driving towards, you know, minimizing the damage or, or addressing the damage when it happened? I'm just Actually, kidding. that's a very good uh, point you brought up. Uh, that is correct. We've got lots and lots of maintenance to do. Actually, in my report, I'm going to go over them. You, you see them. Uh, the system is, you know, is not, uh, you know, it's a, right now, it's in a okay shape. However, we got lots and lots of uh, uh, expenditures that we're going to have to do for maintenance. You know, we got transformers that they aged. Uh, we got lots of uh, open wires that they need to be replaced and upgraded. We got lots of connections, services, as well as, you know, the primary connections. We got lots of, they, this, the infrastructure is old, you know, and we need to, to update those. Right. And it costs money. And that's why you see that capital expenditures, you know, they, they've been going up for the past five years. And it's going to keep continue going up for the next 10 or 15 years because we're not out of the woods yet. Uh, because, you know, nothing has happened so far. It doesn't mean the system is, you know, it's, it, 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 it's okay for now. It's running. However, you know, due to the age, you don't know how long that's going to last. <clears throat> so we've made lots and lots of improvements, and we still got a lot that we need to do in order to make it stronger. Yeah. Um, no, you're, you've laid out you know, the yeah, CapEx projects over the next several years, which are yeah. impressive. The system hasn't been really maintained for over the past 15 to 20 years. Mm. And you know, uh, that's why we have to now spend some money in order to put reinforcement into the system. We still need to build a new substation. I'm desperately needed right. new substation. You know, it's going to cost close mm -hmm. anywhere between seven to $11 million in Ballardvale area because the station five <coughs> is antiquated. I don't know how long this is gonna last. I don't know whether it's gonna last till next week or the, your guess is as good as mine. We haven't been able to secure the land, you know, <coughs> at least yet, but we have a, you know, uh, prospect for it. But, uh, you know, it, the work, uh, it's in the works, it's in the process. We're trying to negotiate to secure the land but this is what happens. I mean, if that transformer goes, you know, it could cost you anywhere between uh, $150,000 to $200,000 a month to rent the equipment. And that's but one but of the biggest. But it's clear, I mean, even the few years that it's been on this uh, oh pathway. Yeah. The reliability has been getting better because, you know, we have uh, spent some of that money to put the reinforcement into the system, make it stronger reliability-wise. But this is, we are only at the beginning of the road. This is only, you know, maybe 10 percent, not even, mm. you know. But every year as we're making these expenditures and we spend more money, the system is getting better and better and better. But we got a plan. We got a 20, we got a 30-year plan that, you know, uh, maintenance. That we have. Every year we know exactly what we should do. Obviously, we can't spend it all in one year or two years. It's impossible. But we got a 30-year plan that, you know, every year for every fiscal year, you're going to see how much we need in every, for every maintenance plan, transformers, switches, wires, secondary services, substations. And all of these are laid out in, 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 in and scheduled. And 
I'm just giving you warming you up for you know what's coming <laughs> 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 right. for, for the budget. Can right. you see that? <laughs> yeah, save you. You're not gonna time. think that you know <laughs> I got two heads and what. <laughs> okay. Okay. Any other comments or questions from the commission? Oh, Great job. Thank you. Thank you. Only one oh, thing. This is showing okay. just the oh. Twitter follow-ups. You know, for the first storm, we got like 180. We gained 187, and brought it up to 1,624. The second storm, 607 more people they joined. The third storm, 30 more, and now we got 2,249 followers, <coughs> which we strongly recommend people to join and you know follow up because we keep up, you know, keep people updated about the outage restoration uh, period, estimated restoration time uh, through tweeting. Every area outage is being tweeted right now, but, and, but by next year, you know, you're gonna see messages being dispatched, going to your phones or, you know, your emails or phone calls, so the people they know, they can hear uh, exactly, you know, they can be notified by one of those means. Yeah. Right. I, do, I have one more question. Hamid, um, I know I saw you leave with your suitcase after, yes. like, the <laughs> two days after the storm was over, so I know you probably slept here at least one and night. And I was still married. <laughs> 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 That's a good part about it. <laughs> no, <laughs> my, my question is... I, I proudly do that. I, I'm, I'm proud of my job, I mean, you know. Good. I think she's listening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love you. <laughs> Very good. That's for all already. That's right. That's, that's all, of, all of my customers. I love you all. <laughs> um, asking about the rest of the staff. How do you manage? I imagine you want to have them out there as much as you can when you're in the heart of a storm like that. Right. How do you manage rest and making sure that the guys yes. are fresh and... We have a safety Safe. policy that, you know, we're 16 hours on and six hours off. So if the crews are working 16 hours, they need to come back and they rest. The rest period could be either in the office or they could go home and rest. But, you know, when the, during the storm, when you have, you know, so much activity going on and the roads are not safe, we're keeping them in house. Uh, we got mutual agreement with, you know, with the mutual aid that we have to provide them, you know, some, they, we can't accommodate everybody over here. So we accommodate them in the hotels and, you know, mm -hmm. nearby hotels. Right. For mutual aid. And most crews, they stay so over So they can here. work up to 16 they hours a day. Work up to 16 hours. Then they put, we put them down for six hours. And that's why we have contracting crews that, you know, they could work while the people are rested over here. And uh, we rotate them. So. But uh, during the past storm, I mean, it was overwhelming. I mean, yeah, we tried to do that. Maybe stretch it a little bit to s between 16, 17 hours, mm -hmm. you know, but they got the rest. Yeah. You know. Good. Okay. <coughs> Thanks. I'm good. Yeah. I'm good. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. just to yeah, echo earlier comments by the select <coughs> and, and, and others, uh, congratulations to Colleen, to you and your staff. And Thanks. just, uh, you know, particularly impressed Joyce, you did a great job of sending you communications. That's really helpful to. Yeah. Kind of, you know, it's sort of, it's like watching the stock market, you know, <laughs> the outages go up. <laughs> well, going down is a happy feeling, so it's a little bit reversed. But thank you. That's really helpful to kind of know just how, how things are going. You're welcome. Appreciate it. Okay. All right. All right. Go yeah, back. Very quickly, um, again, thank you for letting me attend the ATPA legislative rally in Washington, D.C. Jane and I went this year. Uh, it provides an opportunity for municipals to appeal to their representing leaders. Uh, Jane and I met with um, Senator Warren's office uh, and Congressman Moulton and uh, Capuano. Uh, this year's appeal addressed short and long-term planning for capacity transmission and fuel in this area. Uh, capacity is an ISO market uh, traded, as uh, I've mentioned in the past. However, capacity is a necessity and should be part of an overall plan to include location and size. Uh, in addition, there is no short and long-term plan for fuel. The winters around here are very difficult to get natural gas here, compounded with frozen harbors uh, to, to permit tankers coming in with oil. Um, while no one wants a pipeline in their backyard, and the Joneses Act prevents uh, non-American ships from transporting fuel like liquid natural gas that is very, very inexpensive from down south. Um, we've seen severe fuel issues during this winter, uh, especially during this last cold snap that we had at the beginning of the winter. 
Braintree, for example, who has a generating station, came within two days of a major brownout because their fuel of oil was not able to come into the uh, Boston harbors because they were frozen. Mm. Wow. So we want our uh, leaders uh, to help address these concerns with the ISO. Uh, we feel that you know it. it you know, w we do our part at the end of the pipeline, uh, but the capacity and transmission that's that's being built and coming at us, we don't really have a lot of say in that. So it's important for us to speak on behalf of um, public power down there because a lot of times we get swooped up into the IOUs and 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 we're different. You know what I mean? And and we want to we want to have a voice. So. Uh, I think it was successful. We have to keep the topics very short, you know, because you want them to remember what you're saying. So it's usually one one strong message. So um, we'll keep you updated uh, on that. So thanks again for letting us go. I think jo Jane and uh, it was very educational for Jane as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's great. great. So that's yeah. what I have on that. Uh, the next thing, if, if there's no questions, I'll go right on to the organizational. Study. Right. Right. Now, in the agenda, we, we've listed the reliability uh, report too. I understand due to the storm that we will not, that report is not ready for us tonight. So it's only going to be the organizational report. So, Colleen. Right. Usually gives that one. Um, so for the organizational study, as you remember, it was a significant amount of uh, recommendations made by Lidos. And um, instead of going through, you know, the list uh, that we've gone through on a number of quarters, um, and the same thing I did with the cab, we're down to just a handful of things that either have not, are not ongoing being addressed, meaning they are things that you, once you address them, you do them forever. So the majority of them have either been addressed and they're ongoing or they're completed. So we've gotten a significant amount done. Um, some of the things that have not been, which I will report on, uh, it, but we have addressed them, is the um, assessing the organizational culture and employee, um, we're, we're hoping to do that in the fall of this year, which Joyce is going to help us out for internal surveys. And then another one is customer satisfaction would be external surveys. Um, we didn't do it. We, you know, we had union contracts that were at the beginning of the year, and we wanted to get that out of the way. Everyone's going through their career development process. So everything's starting to settle down. Probably a good time to both do both internal and external um, surveying. Uh, the second one, uh, really, that's left on the list is the asset management work order management system. And we've had a couple of vendors come in. Wendy's got that in the budget for next year. And uh, that's really going to help us because, um, again, the asset and the work order management is more chiseling on a rock. And so we're very excited to move forward with that technology where, um, you know, we'll be able to, it'll make accounting a lot more efficient. It'll make time cards more efficient. Everything will is, is pulled into the asset and work, work, work order management system. And, and I think it will be a, um, a, a great improvement. So. That's all I have to report. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Colleen, uh, two, two or comment or question. Number one is uh, some of us on the board, uh, Dave Hennessy, I would say particularly maybe others, myself have some uh, experience in this survey piece. So at the right time, if you or Jane would like some thoughts around any, anything to do with that, I'd be happy to. No, that would that be that great. Well. That would be really good. Uh, Thank you. You're welcome. And then the other question that I had is, uh, was it, to do with, uh, and if it's not now, and when Wendy does the financials, I was curious. Uh, when we review the financials, I know you have, it reminded me of the organization report, we have headcount that we are targeting to hire as part of the organizational study. Uh, you have other headcount that doesn't uh, get replaced like a way, right away like every company. So uh, I guess really my question is, are we, in terms of your optimum of workforce here, uh, how many headcounts still need to be filled, and is the cost of those reflected in our financials? I would think not, because they've not been expended, but I don't know if you have some other way of capturing. We, we have the vacancies are captured in our, in our financials. Um, they are? In the budget, Why, what yes. is that, sort of like a, an accrued liability of some sort? Or? No, we just when do you come up come up and speak yeah. at the microphone yeah, they're, so in your, they're in the, the budget cable. but they're not in, they're not come they're up with the microphone budget. so the cable so the uh, RCTV just can hear knows what we're saying so as you know currently we're working on the uh, the budget yep. to finalize for the end of the month and that's when we come up with a total that we feel as though uh, our vacant positions in every department right. so year to year it changes based on how many people we've hired and how many have retired 
Right. So uh, in the budget, y those numbers are reflected. But we also have to bring in crews, outside crews, in order to fill those vacancies while we don't have the right. talent in-house. So as much as the budget reflects the numbers, the actual numbers are also reflective of how much money we have to actually pay those outside that crews. That is it pretty much a, a wash? Is that what you're saying? I mean, I don't know if it's, I don't, I wouldn't say it's a wash because we're still not getting the full um, value of an actual, you know, in-house person. But, you know, and, uh, we, and when you may. a benefit factor, so right. it may be. Uh, you okay. may actually I'm pay more. The reason is, is make sure we understand what, right. what our total real expenses are, but right. at least you're covering that. And what, yes. what is the, what's the headcount still to be filled, would you say, Colleen? I think the headcount's probably like around 73 right now. Yeah, right. yeah, but where is it from target? What's the target? Uh, I'm not, I'm not positive. Like I said, we're, we're looking at that right now for the Historically budget. Historically, it's gone all the way up to 85. Uh, I'm a little hesitant to give a number because we did the, the high-level organizational study and yep. we're going through each department now, and it's at a more of a granular level. Like we, we're, we just finished up IT. Um, and so what happens is when someone retires, we may not replace them with the exact job description because as, That's good. as we're you know, moving forward, we're looking at succession, mm -hmm. we're looking at you know, what does the company yeah. need now, not right. what did the company need before. Right. So we're always looking ahead. So um, you know, we, we tag the position, but when we're doing the granular, yep. okay. you understand what I'm saying. Yeah, yep. so, um, that's you know, good. I mean, that's it's the right probably way about it. seven or eight vacancies at this point right now, but um, like I said, we're, we're, we have three more divisions to look at at a lower level. Um, good. Okay? I'm good. Yep. Thank you. All set? Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Very good. You all set, Colleen? Yes, thank you. Okay. So, Jane, you're up next. Mm-hmm. Thank you. I'm here to report on January's uh, purchase power. Um, so as Colleen had mentioned, and we discussed this when we went down to D.C., January, the first uh, week and a half of January was an extremely cold period of time. Um, the ISO uh, had a lack of gasoline, uh, natural gas, excuse me, uh, which caused a lot of our oil units to run. Our Stony Brook plant in, uh, uh, in Ludlow, Massachusetts, uh, just to give you a, a snapshot, la uh, last year uh, the unit, our, our fuel cost for that particular unit was less than $10,000. Uh, this year uh, our fuel cost for the Stony Brook plant was in excess of $975,000. Oh, wow. Um, so the oil within that particular unit was running at, um, for the intermediate, about $129 per megawatt hour, and the peaking unit was just under $200 per megawatt hour. Um, so um, this looked at heating degree days, and if you can see from the bar chart, uh, 2018 was significantly colder uh, than 2016 and both um, 2017. Uh, we, we, uh, our kilowatt hour sales in 2018 amounted to a little over uh, 58.2 million, uh, and that compares to 2017 of 56 million and uh, 2016, which is very mild at 48 million. So. It was significantly colder, people used more energy, hence their electricity bills were a little higher. If we look at this, however, and it's kind of interesting, uh, our fuel charge was significantly lower. Um, and that's because based on historical, we, you're not predicting this cold snap um, because it's very abnormal conditions. If we looked at the average of those two, you'd probably get something right in between that. Um, so our fuel, we ended up using more of our deferred fuel cash reserve, uh, which allows us to flatten the curve to our customers. <coughs> so they aren't, they're not seeing price spikes for that. Um, we had anticipated taking about 600,000 out of the deferred fuel, um, and in January we took about 1.3 million out of there. So um, that's allowing us to, and again, we'll replenish that, but that's what we use to um, to help us smooth through these these so, uh, so the fund is acting as a buffer for correct, all of our rate correct payers. exactly um, this is a snapshot of, of the ISO markets and as you can see the blue one this is the day ahead market so the ISO has a day ahead in a real time uh, so the day ahead is a financial settlement and real time is what actually happens um, so this looks at, if you look at the blue that was 2017 and it was relatively uneventful you know prices were came up a little higher than $50, but they were pretty much below 50 for the entire month. 
when we look at the red line and compare 2018, it's all over the place. It's, consist it's consistently higher. It um, exceeded costs of over $200 per megawatt hour, um, and, it was, and it was consistently higher. So that is reflective also in our overall power, su power supply costs for the month of uh, January. Uh, this is the real time, which is what really happens. And again, on those, those very first week of January when that cold snap was hitting us, prices were just below $300 per megawatt hour. They did come down, but they remained relatively high over the course of the month, you know, on 150, and then it tapered down as the weather got warmer towards the end of the month. So again, this goes through purchase power. It's re reflective in the fuel. Um, I did mention the Stony Brook plant ran, um, but it, costs have come down in February and March, and you'll see that in the next couple of monthly reports that we provide. Mm -hmm. I think that's I it. I have a quick question for Jane. Sure. Jane, how many, what percentage of, of our ratepayers have electric heat? It's a small percentage. I don't know. I, I can get that number for you. No, I don't need yeah. it. I just, it's I'm curious why there's such a, it's a big less spike. less than 10%. Yeah, so why is there a, such a big spike because for kilowatt hours? Because, um, again, when it's cold outside, your furnaces are running. Furnaces have motors and fans. Mm. Um, all that stuff is adding to people's yeah. usage. Right. Um, it's kicking on more because yeah. it's so cold it has to run a little harder. Um, so it's not necessarily relate. People are home more because they don't want to go out. Uh. So they, I mean, it's a good thing for us because they're using more electricity. <laughs> um, it's just difficult when prices are so volatile. Yeah. Well, this incorporates commercial customers as well, Correct. right? Correct. Exactly. So commercial right. customers face the same thing. They, sure. they turn on need space to open their stores too, right? and turn on oh, space heaters. Correct. A lot of uh, offices, right. you know, yeah. they, they can't regulate the temperature, so you know they have employees with the space heaters. So again, right. that increases uh, the I'm, usage. Yeah. Thank you. Great question. Okay. Thank you. All right. We're all set. Yep. Okay. Wendy, you're next. I know you have to. Okay. Um, tonight I'm reporting on the uh, financials for January 31st for the first seven months of the fiscal year 18. Um, so if you just look at the balance sheet, just a quick snapshot um, in, in my, my own words here of what's happening. So uh, as you can see, the unrestricted cash really hasn't increased that much. It's only about $250,000. And the restricted cash is up about $6 million, but that's uh, mostly due to the pension trust that's been added um, on the books at FY17. Then the receivables are up 1.6 million from last year, and currently we are at 94% uh, current receivables in-house, so we're doing a good job collecting. And then if you look at the capital assets, we're about increase of 3.7 million from prior year, but our accounts, our accounts payable are up 2 million as well. Wendy, before you jump off that page, can you explain yes. The, uh, the operating fund as to what, what the, the theory behind the op we're using the balances of the operating fund. You yes, have so I, many months. I actually have a whole uh, oh, slide a presentation on that today. Coming? Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Great, if you, you want me to go into that right now, No, I no, can. that's, uh, you want yeah. to go into that now or you want no, to? No, I have no. so, uh, two quick questions, Wendy. So uh, what, obviously, restricted cash is restricted, but uh, right. what, what can it be used for practically anything other than no. intended use? Or? I mean, there are uh, just jump quickly. Why don't you jump to that presentation? Since we're uh, asking before you, the, the other question, then we'll be off my question to Miss Page. The receivables went up. The sales are pretty much flat, right? I mean, maybe yes. I've thought this through. So what, it just what, could what, be, timing? literally could be timing. Yeah. Okay. I mean, we, ne we never can be positive about uh, yeah. when the billing, the, the amount of days in the billing cycle. Yeah. Right. You know what I'm I saying? Also, I also okay. believe at this time of year we're not allowed to turn anybody off, I believe. No, so we're still in moratorium. We're still in Correct. the moratorium. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So. You don't want to pay your bill. You can't get turned off. <laughs> but we are collecting 94% current, so um, we're, yep. we're in pretty good shape. All right. Yep. So. Mm -hmm. uh, the moratorium expires next month. Yes. Good. Yes. <laughs> so those. So yeah, I will so answer. Beware. <laughs> <laughs> I will answer your question, Tom. If you turn to the second page, yeah. that's our uh, schedule of cash, unrestricted and restricted. So quickly counting, you have about 12 uh, restricted cash funds. So you have to use the cash for exactly what it 
what it says there. So we know our depreciation and construction is for our capital projects. Um, your deferred fuel is to level off uh, the fuel, the uh, the expense and the what we bill out our customers monthly. As the rate stabilization fund uh, is for any kind of situation where we would need to drastically increase our customer rates, and we wouldn't want to we wouldn't want to pass off that burden to the customers. We would dip into that fund if we needed to. But the rate stabilization fund could also be used in a case where uh, we would need to. Um, put some capital infrastructure out in the field and we don't have the funds to do it yeah. and uh, if we felt as though that was the right strategic plan at the moment we could go that in that direction yeah. Good. Thank you. and then the rest of it of course the pension trust and then you have your uh, sick leave buyback yeah. and then a few small things like energy conservation and our customer deposits of course we cannot touch those Got so it. that clarifies the restricted yeah. part perfect thank you Okay. Do you want to address the operating while you're here? On the this operating, page? sure. Yeah. I mean, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, the first slide, okay. So if you look at the first slide here, what I've presented today uh, addresses exactly your question, Phil. Um, the yellow bars show the operating cash at the end of the year from FY14 to FY17, so those are actual figures. And then what I've put uh, for FY18 to FY23 are what we're, we're budgeting, so what we're projecting to come in at. And then the purple bar shows the average monthly expense. So what I mean by average monthly expense is if you take your total operating expenses for the year, you divide that by 12 and you get a monthly, uh, a monthly average, okay? So we're looking for basically how many months of operating expenses are we holding in our operating cash? Because that's kind of a benchmark for any financial professional to, to say how we're doing. And I've kind of been on Colleen with this uh, to, to kind of come up with an area where we feel comfortable. Okay, so that's why I did this graph for you tonight. So if you look at uh, FY14, we start climbing with our operating cash because we're trying to build it up to where we feel comfortable in order to fund our capital projects coming up, okay? So then as you look at going down as we're projecting, our operating expenses to our operating cash goes from about two months and then you're going down into about one and a half month supply of operating expenses. And I, and I know some individuals, uh, like Mr. Stempek, may think that uh, three months is very conservative. But when you're dealing with, you know, uh, ratepayers' money, and, um, you know, it's, it's not the same as a regular business. You want to make sure that you're not being un irresponsible with ratepayers' funds. So that's why I think it's important to have enough money. Three months is a little too conservative. I like to stay on the two-month side, personally. Um, but it's important to have enough money in case something comes up so that we do not have to pass off the burden to our customers. Okay, does that explain and, it? So and I agree with you. I mean, I, I mean that's how we've gotten right. to uh, be here for over 100 years, right, exactly. because we're a conservative organization, and, and that's very important right. to have. And we're being responsible with our, with right. our cash. And, right. um, yeah, so I think, uh, you know, not that we're panicked by any means, but it, with revenues flattening, yes, you know, that creates other potential needs for cash, right? Right, that, exactly. That we may not have had, so it provides some security. Right. right. But as Colleen has mentioned also, uh, of course you do have, like I also just mentioned, we do have the rate stabilization in, the, in a case where it, you know, power supply goes out of our control, the costs go way up, and we, you know, we don't want to pass that off to our customers. And also in the need of um, capital, um, in, the, in the need to put infrastructure in the field that we don't have the cash for, if it came to that point. Right. So we could draw on the rate stabilization fund for that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, a, it's an excellent way to handle the volatility of our right. business, right? Because right. you just don't know what's going to happen month to month or year to year as you're your heating days showed. I mean, it could right. be a, a huge difference. So I'll, I'll move right into the second slide okay. uh, to kind of, you know. So I should say, uh, no, no, no company that I know of went out of business because they kept too much cash. So. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I don't think but, it, but it, you know, it, all, it, it, it appears that we have too much, but when you look at the numbers, yeah. we don't. Yeah. We're just being responsible is yeah. what we're doing. Right. So the second slide, um, <coughs> the green bar, shows the net income, and <coughs> FY14 to FY17 are actual numbers, and uh, FY18 to 20, 
23, <coughs> sorry, I didn't change the title, 23 are projected. And what the blue bar shows are our capital projects, what's at, what we've actually spent and what we're projected to spend. And then you have your yellow, your yellow line there that shows our rate of return, what we've actually come in at and what we're targeting. So what the real, what you take out of this graph really is if you look at our net income, the green bar, and you look at the blue bar, we're always taking the money that we, we get from our net income and reinvesting it. Right? That's, that really tells a, a story right there. We're consistently reinvesting our money into our capital infrastructure because as Hamid points out in his presentation and as Colleen tells you, you know, the system's been uh, not maintained uh, the way it should be necessarily, but we're getting it up to speed and we're continuously uh, moving forward to make sure that we have a reliable system at all times, especially in a time of a storm where everybody appreciates that. So I think and that really tells a, pic tells a story right there. Yep. Uh, and, and I think we just need to reinforce that this is a very, very technical reason. I mean, we, you know, you, you can't just sort of look at the numbers and make uh, assumptions. You need to know what's in the system. You need to be an electrical engineer. You need to know what works. When you go past the 25 year uh, on the transformers, for example, and you expect them to work out to 50 years, and it doesn't happen. And I think the storms are a perfect example of what, what can happen. And you know, losing your internet is an annoyance, as we say, but when you lose your electricity, yeah. it's, it's life threatening. Right. And of course, we don't have full control over everything, but right. we want to make sure our infrastructure is solid. Okay. So that's all I have for graphs tonight. I thought they were pretty, um, <laughs> pretty helpful, especially since we, what we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. But I just want to uh, point out the, the capital funds um, page. So that's the third page. It shows where we, where we get our money to fund our capital projects. And um, we got about $8.6 million this year to fund our capital projects, of which 3.5 has been spent already. So we have a little over 5 million left. Um, and, and we do have, and Hamid will talk to you about this, we do have capital projects still coming down the line uh, to finish off FY18. And then if we look at our, um, our revenue and our operating and maintenance expenses as compared to the budget, which is the final, um, uh, the final financial on the packet, so currently, um, in talking with Jane and her group, we're about $510,000 under budget for collecting on our base revenue, which is about almost 2% down currently. And then um, we have under collected approximately $1.8 million in power expenses, which you know we uh, try to recoup month to month. Mm -hmm. And then just looking at the budget overall, uh, we should have about 41.6% remaining, which is uh, five months left of the year. And our operating and maintenance expenses are um, continuously under budget. Who knows what the storm is going to bring. <laughs> but, right, uh, but as of January 31st, we are under budget um, in our operating and maintenance expenses. Yeah, yeah. And some of that could be because um, we have some vacancies, just so you know. But it's 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 a good outlook right now except the um of course we're down on our revenue uh, wendy i'm sorry what yes. what slide shows the revenue decline i'm not sure if i'm on the i'm sorry the it's it's the the final financial financial the one that says uh, statement of budgeted revenues expenses and changes yeah so, so you you, <coughs> you don't actually see it but i just know the numbers behind the scenes just telling you from looking at the actual year to date based on the budget we're yep. about five hundred and ten thousand dollars under budget on our base revenue. And you, you approximate that at 2%? Almost 2%, yes. Okay. Uh, but Wendy, uh, these are terrific uh, displays. Just uh, on the, uh, just because I, I know we're still figuring out the room, but on the, uh, the PowerPoint slides um, in the future meetings, if you have a copy of those, could we get a copy of those? Yes, I apologize. That would be good. It's good stuff, and I would, especially the one you talked about in the operating profit. But let me send that to you in an email. How about that? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, once you send it to the, it's all the commissioners. The, yes. You know, right. the room is not. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I'm sorry. But okay. that's fine. It's they're, they're good. Yeah. They're good displays. I think you should share yeah. that with all the commissioners. I would love. Yeah. I will. Okay. I'll definitely send it to you. Okay. Any other chair? Wendy, do you have an estimate, or maybe it's 
Colleen, um, about how much the storm costs. Is there, do you have a sense of that? Is that? We are still working on payroll for last week. Okay. We haven't even gotten to the payroll for this week. Okay. Um, so at, at this moment. Any wild guesses? Colleen or uh, Wendy? No. A lot. no. I'm just, a I'm lot. just curious. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> yeah. A lot. I mean, you have to understand. <laughs> Hundreds yeah. of thousands of dollars. You have to understand That's the right. guys worked around the clock for, and, and the, the mutual aid for about five days. Right. Straight. And we pay for them and we pay right. for their expenses and right. hotels right. and everything. So right. hundreds of thousands. Definitely. Right. Thanks. Okay. Anything else? All right. Anybody Good. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Great. All right. Hamid, you back up again. New material, please. <laughs> 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 Ref will talk to, talk to his wife again on TV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she got lots of right? <laughs> 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 well, I'm here to report the month of January uh, expenditures for en engineering operations. Uh, the first slide, you see all the capital improvement projects. These are the ones that, you know, uh, they be you approved in the budget for, uh, for this year, for this fiscal year that ends June 30th. Uh, the next slide basically is showing you the non-capital, uh, the capital authorization project that they're not basically the uh, project, but with it's, it's still, uh, you know, expenditures like pole settings, overhead, and underground uh, wire upgrades, and hazmat, and porcelain cutouts, and all of those. For the month of January, we spent $132,888. That brings the year to date to $805,795. So we're making a steady progress on those. Uh, as I mentioned uh, the last time, uh, most of our projects, they were the big ticket items that they're, they're happening now between now to June. Station 3 and, you know, some of the upgrades of the 35 KV lines and as well as uh, you know, some restructuring of the uh, 115 KV uh, system. Uh, so the next slide shows the IRD and IT uh, the f and facilities, how much they spent in the month of uh, January and the, the remaining balance you see on the far right. Uh, all in all, uh, in the month of January, January, all departments, we spent $756,962. That brings uh, the year to date to $3,493,520. Uh, $3, and uh, uh, we got uh, $4 million almost uh, to spend, $4.2 million to spend for the remaining of the year that I'm going to spend it. That's a good news. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> so what will, the, uh, what will the fiscal year spend be total? The eight million. Uh, the budget fiscal year, it was budgeted seven, uh, seven million six hundred eighty-five thousand and five hundred twenty-one dollars So the remaining is four million. So for 3.5 million almost we uh, will so spend. Uh, I mean, uh, yes. I just want to maybe Wendy could jump in to uh, Colleen. So is it, is it, are we covering uh, CapEx from both the operating profit and also from depreciation? Is that what we're doing? Because we, if you look at the yes. P&L, it looks like we're taking about three million out of <coughs> operating. We're taking, we're taking money from last year's uh, net income right. and, and we're bringing it over. <coughs> and then of course we have the depreciation expense of 3% that is restricted for capital funds. Mm -hmm. What is that? Is that about three million? Or? No, it's about 4.3 million. Okay, so the seven, so three million is coming from operating profit, and there's another four point something coming from. That's correct. Which is tip, the normal depreciation kind yeah. of approach. Okay, good. Right. Yeah. So it's fully funded. Yep. The next slide shows you the routine maintenance. These are the programs that you know we were talking about. How much maintenance the system requires. So. so uh, transformers, uh, transformer replacement, pole inspection, quarrel inspection of the feeders, manhole inspection, porcelain cutouts. So we're making great prog progress on those. And as we're upgrading those uh, equipment and uh, extending the life, uh, which is going to go back to the capital and uh, the, the uh, net plant increase. Uh, the next slide shows the tree trimming, uh, substation maintenance, and underground subdivisions. Sure. We're go making great. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm guessing that the, uh, <coughs> the, 
the relatively smaller number of uh, outages uh, in our aggressive tree trimming are connected in some way? Yes. So we hadn't trimmed as It well. is, but we still had during the past the storm lots of tree issues. And oh, yeah, are, you not know, to but I'm just saying, had we done less That's right. Uh, we made a great uh, progress on those. You're going to see in the last slide that, you know, over the past five years average, the tree trimming it shows less and less tree-related issues we have. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that shows improvement. Yep. And, yeah, it's a great program. It, it's working. And uh, it's getting better and better. Uh, however, we still, unfortunately, too. we still can't control, you know, during the storm, like p lots of pine trees. Uh, most of these pine trees that, you know, we had trouble with uh, during the, during the past yeah, the storm. No, I mean, and, you know, we can't, uh, we had some, uh, some pine trees that from across the street, they landed in the wires and uh, on other sure, wires, the other side of the street. Very, very tall. And, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's one of the, these tall pine trees, shallow roots, you know, causing trouble. Uh, so the tree trimming, we did 71 span month of January and year to date 728 uh, span through the December. Substation maintenance, uh, we infrared uh, scanned the uh, station equipment and so far we haven't had uh, any hot spot or issues that needed to be addressed. The underground subdivision upgrade, mm -hmm. this is huge. This is one of those uh, really old antiquated uh, uh, facilities that, you know, underground facilities that we're trying to take care of and, you know, take care of and we've been doing, trying to pick, you know, the worst ones, uh, prioritize them by the age. And uh, we've been doing so many a year. Now we're getting a little bit more aggressive and you see that as part of the proposal for the uh, FY19 budget. Uh, so recently we com completed Crestwood Estate in North Reading, Aspen Road in North Reading and Long Hill Lane. These are the ones that, you know, we replaced everything, the underground, the transformers, connections, everything. It's really uh, rebuilt. And we got the number of other uh, uh, sub subdivisions that are in progress. Shasta Drive, Westover Drive, uh, Greenbrier Drive, uh, Great Neck Drive, uh, Gandalf Estate, Deerfield, and Cherokee Lane in Wilmington. So they're all over, Wilmington, North Reading, and, and you know, we got subdivisions that they go up, uh, the ages are almost 50 years. And, uh, and Hamid, are, are we using our own crews to do that? Uh, we both, we're using, yes. Uh, Colin and I, we, we, what we did, we trained our crews for underground uh, the splices and underground uh, construction. So uh, they now, they're fully confident that they can do that job, and, and not a problem. However, because we got limited crews, we still need to augment them by, by the contractors because it's overwhelming. I mean, all of these communities that, you know, we need to do, all of you touch one uh, transformer, all of a sudden, you know, you can't just leave the area without doing the one next over and the one next over because they're all the same vintage. And then the cable, you know, is old. So you have to do that. Uh, we have only limited crews that they can do that. So we have to definitely use contractors for the next 10, 15 years. Mm. Uh, it's it's in inevitable, you know. Thank you. You're welcome. You had a question, Tom? Yeah, actually, I was, I was wondering, and maybe not yet because of more <coughs> investments I know you guys are making, but do we have any, uh, you know, some companies have like a risk assessment model where they'll go in and say, okay, we know the substation is at risk and it's going to cost seven million, so that'll go on the, on the chart with a degree of probability, and so you, sort of helps you understand how much capital and reserves you might need because not, not, not all of it's going to happen, but something or some right. of it will. So I, right. I'm just wondering if you seem to be aware of a lot of those, but I yes. wonder if any of it's been memorialized into that kind of thing or if that's even valuable because it sounds like, you know, if you captured it all, there's probably right. tens of millions of dollars that could happen <coughs> or maybe some small percentage of that will happen and, and you know, as commissioners and as staff, we right. want to make sure we've got money in the, in the yeah. budgets to at least prepare uh, Actually, that. what we've had, uh, I showed Colleen the other day that, you know, we got like all of those seven maintenance programs. Yeah. We got them listed all day. Now that we did GIS, now it's completed. We can get even better that data, more yeah. better planning, put it this way. We have for every one of those uh, maintenance programs, we got, we have uh, prioritized them based on the age and the, the, the equipment durability. Uh, you know, like transformers, not more than 25 years, yeah. and you know these subdivisions underground. Basically, it's bit anywhere between to 20 to 30 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you know, we have prioritized them up to, believe it or not, uh, I won't be here by FY30, 35. Sure. 
Phil will be. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, well, you're going to see that, you know, that uh, and even we forecasted how much, you know, with the escalating cost of the construction, how much would it cost. So we have <coughs> a good estimate of, you know, how much we need to spend. And that's yeah. how we pre pre present our budget. Yeah. I guess the question is, that's perfect. <coughs> Some percentage of that may be very small are things that we really need to not only do, but <coughs> might have to do on a very urgent basis, you know what I mean? Because right. the equipment's so old, you know that right. you might not get through the fiscal year. So right. I'm just wondering if, the, you know, if that's something you look at or... Yeah, we, lo we look at everything, but... Yeah, go, yeah. yeah. go ahead. So we, we did the reliability, and they, a consultant came in and looked <coughs> after Hamid did the assessment, then I did an assessment, um, and the GIS data gives you your ages. We work with the, the uh, manufacturers of the equipment, um, and w as Hamid said, we have this planned out for 30 years. I mean, now, when you're looking at equipment, you can go in and assess it. But if, like for a substation, for example, you would have to take the whole thing apart and there might be internal insulation problem, oh, sure. no, okay? Yeah. That from the outside, it look, you know, a, a consultant might say, well, that's probably gonna last you 10 years. But when then we start taking it apart and the insulation's gone, yeah. It's like, okay, do you, are you going to spend the money to fix the insulation? What do you do? And, and so the risk assessment becomes a lot more intrusive, I guess, um, and, and that's what Hamid and I have been trying to do. With, with these maintenance programs, we're really getting into the fine detail and training our own employees to be able to do that so that these assessments and risks can be put into that 30-year plan. So. I feel like we're doing that. I don't think that a consultant could do a better job than what we're doing. It, it oh, would no, be no, I, it really is better done internally. I was just wondering, you know, if uh, there's some percentage of that big 30-year piece that you kind of know, boy, that has some of this. You can't look inside, but, you know, if wires are hanging from right. somewhere, you know that that right. probably has to get Well, done. scheduling the equipment for maintenance and replacement, <coughs> I think we've got it down. And then I, I told you recently you work with an economist yeah. that verified that, that this amount of money we're spending, about $8 million a year, is appropriate for the age of the equipment, the size of this uh, system, the territory, and so we're spot on. So no matter what angle we look at it to verify it so that I don't get caught saying something that isn't accurate, we've really been verifying it from every angle and it's just spot on every time. So I feel so confident. So spending the $7 million is really... <coughs> oh, it's, this is absolute minimum. Yeah. I did an analysis to see how much would it cost if we wanted ready to do all of the stuff that, you know, in a most expeditious manner, yeah. like squeeze them and then maybe into five to ten years. You'd be, be, you'd be spending anywhere close to 20 to 25 million dollars a year if you wanted to do that. But we know we don't have that money, we can't do that, and we're trying to spread it, uh, you know, and prioritize them to the best yeah. we can so we can, you know, address all of those issues. And, you know, it's... Uh, the plan is there, there, and we have estimated how much will it cost, and you know all of those. But some of those are happening, you know, especially in the underground subdivisions. Like some of those that you don't expect it to happen, you know, and all of a sudden you have problems that you have to get in there. Sure. Some utilities, what they do, they take a band-aid approach. They're gonna say, okay, we're gonna fix this one, and then we get back to the next one when it happens. It's just a matter of time before the next one happens, and mobilization, demobilization is gonna cost you more money. So we're trying to plan it so it's a most cost efficient way to do that. We get into the, the, the get into that area, we fix them all, we get out. <coughs> so that way, you know, it's done in one shot, right? And in pieces that you know you're gonna end up spending at least thirty percent more than what you, uh, if you do it the first time, do it right. Does it make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Good. Any qu any other questions? Okay. Good. Thanks. So the next one is. Uh, Basically, the next one, the devil poles, you've seen this, uh, you know, uh, uh, over and over again. The ownership of the poles are 50-50 with RMLD and Verizon. We've got approximately 16,000 po poles. The custodial half in Reading and North Reading is with the RMLD. The rest in uh, Reading and Linfield and Wilmington is with Verizon. Uh, the next one is my favorite uh, slide. Uh, uh, so it shows the uh, engines, the basically ball in court. RMLD in the lane field, we got seven transfers to do and two pole bots to remove. In North Reading, we got 12 transfers and 35 pole bots to remove. Reading, we got 24 transfers and 59 pole bots to remove. 
and uh, in Wilmington, you see 32 transfers and four pole watts to remove. Actually, this is showing it might not look good, you know, with the double poles, but as I've always said that, and Jason could agree with me, I guess, what you do as you're setting these new poles, actually you're upgrading the facilities with it. Uh, I mean, the old poles they've taken out and new poles they've gone in, and you know, you're upgrading the constructions, you're adding to your plant value. So this is a good thing, I know, and, but it's going to take some time. This is always, it's a moving target. We can't just, you know, immediately remove the pole, but until everybody is transferred. And we have no control over Verizon and Comcast. As much as the people, they might be thinking that, you know, we've got connections and, you know, they listen to us. They've got their own systems. <coughs> so we do the best we can trying to take care, uh, take care of those, but we don't have any control in the, over their operations, especially they're cutting back forces too. So the next slide shows you the reliability, the health of the system. Sadie, say KD, and Safi, they're all well under uh, uh, regional and uh, uh, national, uh, basically, um, uh, baselines for comparing to the, uh, those averages uh, for the national and regional uh, averages. So and this is takes well. into account the storm as well, or is well, this? Well, this one, uh, well, uh, yeah, there are two, the, the numbers, you know, when the storms, they really throw these off. Right, It's exactly. like, you know, your blood pressure, when you go to doctors, all of a sudden <laughs> it's, you know, going up to 180 <laughs> to 100, you know. Right. But then during the normal time, it goes back to normal. So the major storms like that, we following the reli e reliability tracker APPA guideline that would allow us to say that, you know, okay, these are exceptional. So we take those out. And then, you know, we're taking the rest of the system, you know, that, you know, well, you know, the normal operations, and you compare sure. those with that. If you want to go with those, then they, they're the numbers, they go in the actual regional national averages, the bar goes higher. And then, you know, it doesn't make any sense to show that well, for one spot, high spike. Sure, right, exactly. Uh, same as the fuel charges, you know, that, you know, it, it goes up out of a sudden, doesn't mean it's going to stay up for always, it is fluctuating. So the same thing with the, with the storms, depending on severity of storms. And, you know, it wouldn't be really fair to compare yourself against the community that, you know, they saw the storm, but they had less damages. Uh, and, you know, we had more storm hit us more, and we had more damages on our, 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 in our systems. So to answer your questions, the major storms like that, they, they're not uh, they're taken out. Sure. But the rest of them, yeah, they're all in. Every other single outages that you know daily here yeah, that happens, they're included. So the last slide shows you the causes of outages. The blue lines they show you bars. They show you basically the annual, uh, the average for uh, for the fa past five years, the averages, and the red line bars they show you what where we are in in 2008 with every single categories. And with the trees, you see that, you know, the average we've had 57 for the past five years, and now, so far, we have two. So, mm. but, wow. yeah, right. you know. So, me, down to yeah. weather, so does that, the last three storms we've had, would they, wouldn't they be? No, this is for the month of January. Oh. Yeah, they the report the fall month, month, month of January. March. So, yeah, so it's, 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 it's only on. one month. Yeah, no, I saw a year to date, but I didn't yeah, see it. Yeah, there is only one, one, one there is, was no storm basically in yeah. January. Yeah. But for the next report, uh, the February, and uh, you're going to see that these numbers go <laughs> up. <laughs> <laughs> you might need a bigger chart. You right? might need a bigger chart. Especially <laughs> the fourth one coming up <laughs> next week, right? We're watching that. Right. right. So, okay. okay. Good. Any questions? No. Well, no. thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Are you doing the procurement? Here we are. Are you doing the procurement too? Oh yes. Yeah. <laughs> Unless you don't need it. <laughs> <laughs> Forgot totally about right. that. Do do I do I no, hear the motion? Somebody want to make the motion? Uh, make a motion. Yeah, Mr. Sure. Stenberg. Uh, su um, see, suggested motion. Uh, move that proposal 2018-37 for pole-mounted transformers be awarded to Westco Distribution Inc. for $91,628. And Gray Bar Electric for nine thousand and forty dollars, for a total of one hundred thousand six hundred and sixty-eight dollars. Wesco, uh, <coughs> pursuant to MGL uh, Section One Sixty Four, Section Fifty Six D, on the recommendation of the general manager. Okay, is that seconded? 
Been moved and seconded. Hamid, you want to give us a setup? Yes. We sent uh, these two uh, 14 uh, uh, vendors or distribution uh, companies. Uh, so we received the bid from uh, four, and the lowest responsible responsive bidders were the Wesco Distribution for $91,628 and Gray Bar for $9,040. These are overhead transformers. Uh, as a part of the transformer replacement program, we go to bid every, you know, uh, every quarter or six months, depending on the needs. But they go on like, you know, flies, you know, they fly uh, out of here. As soon as they come in, they just, you know, we put them up because as part of the transformer replacement program. So this is what it is. We budgeted, uh, we have remaining in capital for uh, 212000 which $100,000 of that is this bid. So after this, there is 112000 left. Okay. That's what we can spend. Discussion, questions? Not all in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed, and motion carries, 5-0. Do I have this, the second motion? Sure. Move that proposal 2018-39 for capacitor banks be awarded to Graybar Electric for $24,314.60 pursuant to MGL 164, Section 56D on the recommendation of the general manager. Is that seconded? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, I mean again? Sure, please. we sent a bid to 16 vendors and we received uh, actually two responses back, two of them that the responsible responsive better. <laughs> These are the cap banks that we use in the system for they do two jobs for us. Actually, they regulate the, the, in, they regulate the voltage as well as uh, minimizing the losses in the system. As we are doing the system expansions, we need to do that to you know, reduce the losses. Uh, the line losses, as well as, you know, boosting the voltage in the areas that they need it. Uh, 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 and we go based on the engineering analysis. There's a, uh, you know, complex uh, analysis involved behind the scene to place them. Uh, so uh, the gray bar uh, was awarded uh, for 20, it's, it's to be awarded to be uh, for $24,314.60. Uh, for those cap banks that you know we ordered, he was the lowest responsible, responsive bidder. The next lowest was the Wesco <coughs> distribution, but by not much. But uh, we are recommending to award the bid to Gray Bar for that amount. Okay. Discussion? Questions? I see none. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Oppose that motion carries 5 0. Very good. Okay, this is also the amount is part of that 200, 12, uh, 12, 12, 200, uh, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, now it's going to be remaining eighty thousand dollars always. Okay. Right. Right. Thank you. All right. Very Thank good. You. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, <laughs> the blooper roll. You want to say good night to? The <laughs> 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 you. Good night. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> Enough for tonight, right? <laughs> 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 Until the next. Right. All right. Okay. So under general discussion, our next meeting is April the nineteenth of two thousand eighteen. Uh, that night, the first order of business be the reorganization of the board. So we need to have that as the first order of business. And um, if, Tracy, you'll actually circulate the uh, board subcommittees to everybody as part of the package to go out. The existing? The existing yep. ones. Yep. So people can look at that in advance. Good idea. Yeah. And then we'll, uh, and we'll, and hopefully So that's we'll our next board meeting. We don't get together after next Wednesday night. <coughs> that's just a subcommittee. It's just a subcommittee. Okay. No, it's just a subcommittee at this point. All right. Um, if we need to, we may have to have a meeting in between. Yeah. We're going to have to play it by ear. Right. We'll play it by ear at that point. Yeah. Okay. And so we see what it happens something next Wednesday. Action would need to do that. Right. Yeah. We'll have to see what, what happens coming yeah. forward. Okay? Yeah. And then hopefully we'll get on a regular schedule that we're going to get going forward. Uh, the CAB I'm covering on March the 21st. I'm s s stand in for John. <laughs> 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 I think it's my third CAB meeting in a row, but that's all right. You know? No, no, wait a minute. I did <laughs> January. Oh, you did January? Yeah. Okay. I, got, I have next month. You got next month, okay? And then Dave's got the one April the 19th, okay? And I don't know if anybody else had anything else for regular session. If not, I'll entertain a motion to go into executive session. 
Uh, move that the board go into executive session to consider the purchase of real property and return to regular session for the sole purpose of adjournment. Right, is that, is that uh, seconded? Second. Second. All those in favor, raise your right hand. I've got a poll board. Uh, Mr. Stenpak? Uh, aye. Mr. Hennessy? Mr. Mr. Aye. Mr. Aye. Mr. Rourke, Mr. Rourke, aye. Mr. Rourke. Mr. Rourke. Mr. Rourke. Okay, we'll go to the other room. Thank you, everybody.